Um, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Raquel Sáenz Rivera, and I am the 2018-2019 Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. Um, it's now my great honor to introduce the Poet Laureate of the United States, Tracy K. Smith. Tracy K. Smith is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Life on Mars. Her other works include the poetry collections Duende. I've always loved this title because it reminds me of Federico Garcia Lorca, um, which won the James Loughlin Award, The Body's Question, winner of the Cave Canem Poetry Prize, and the memoir Ordinary Light, a finalist for the National Book Award. In June 2017, Smith was named the US Poet Laureate and she was recently named Poet Laureate for a second term. She teaches creative writing at Princeton University. Her latest book, Wade and Waters, which she will be reading from tonight, is one of a series of incredible poetry collections, each of which creates its own affective cosmology and treats poetry as love and practices. I spent the last week immersed in Wade in the Water, a book that delves in the intersections of love, history, body, and text. The book opens with an invitation to black love, a ritual that dissolves the past into the future. In writing the book, Smith traveled to Georgia to research Civil War era history, or as Smith described it, what black soldiers were experiencing. And these soldiers' letters to their families and to President Lincoln, many of which make their way into the core of the book. Although the work draws from extensive archival research, what is most striking to me is the way in which the poetry becomes a conduit for borrowed memories. Love is a way of reliving, remembering love denied, lost or repressed. Love becomes a, prax a praxis. In the poem, Unrest in Baton Rouge, the speaker asks, is it strange to say love is a language? Few practice, but all or near all speak. Smith does not limit herself to textual archives. The archives, like the poems, are alive. I could not feel more blessed to be introducing a poet whose work echoed in me long after I read it. We're so pleased to have her here this evening. Ladies, gentlemen, and um, other folk of other genders, please join me in welcoming Tracy K. Smith to the Free Library. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's really such a delight to be here. Um, I got to spend part of this morning talking with high school students um, who were just so wonderful. I, I feel safe when I think about the future um, every time I get to talk to thoughtful young people. Um, so I should do that more often, I feel. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited to share poems from Wade in the Water. It's a book that is really um, leaning toward um, learning what compassion is and how we might live with it more effectively. And so there are poems that look backward toward history and what they often find is sad. It's you know opportunities where um, love might have been a kind of solution, but instead something else was chosen. Um, and I think we're still, in the case of the Civil War, we're still dealing with um, the pain of, of that conflict. Um, and the sense of hate or fear that um, shapes our views of one another or that shaped and that we haven't quite shaken. Um, but there are also poems that are thinking about the here and now. Um, and in the really private poems, I'm looking for a way to sort of snap myself into a better way of looking at other people. I think technology sometimes and convenience and the 21st century um, sometimes makes us believe that other people are an inconvenience. And I'm trying to say, no, that's not right. Um, maybe I will start out with, um, with the opening poem from the book, which is called Garden of Eden. There are a number of poems that kind of draw um, these heavy mythic or biblical titles. Um, and those are the poems that are most anchored to just the small every day. And, um, Maybe you can tell me why that is afterwards. <laughs> Garden of Eden. What a profound longing I feel, just this very instant, for the Garden of Eden, 
on Montague Street, where I seldom shopped, usually only after therapy. Elbow sore at the crook from a handbasket filled to capacity. The glossy pastries, pomegranate, persimmon, quince. Once, a bag of black beluga lentils spilt a trail behind me while I labored to find a tea they refused to carry. It was Brooklyn, my 30s. Everyone I knew was living the same desolate luxury, each ashamed of the same things, innocence and privacy. I'd lug home the paper bags, doing bank balance math and counting days. I'd squint into it or close my eyes and let it slam me in the face. The known sun setting on the dawning century. I'll read you another um, 21st century lament. Um, this is called um, Annunciation, and as you know, the, the biblical Annunciation is the moment that an angel appears to Mary and tells her that she's going to bear Christ as her child, and I think this poem is begging for something to interrupt and disrupt. Um, Annunciation. I feel ashamed, finally, of our magnificent paved roads, our bridges slung with steel, our vivid glass, our tantalizing lights, everything enhanced, rehearsed, a trick. I've turned old. I ache most to be confronted by the real, by the cold, the pitiless, the bleak, by the red fox crossing a field after snow by the broad shadow scraping past overhead. My young son, eyes set at an indeterminate distance, ears locked, tuned inward, caught in some music only he has ever heard. Not our cars, our electronic haze, not the piddling bleats and pings that cause some hearts to race. Ashamed, like a pebble, hard and small. Hoping only to be ground to dust by something large and strange and cruel. I did spend uh, some time over the last year in uh, coastal Georgia in the Sea Islands um, for another project that I'm working on. And... Um, the first of those trips involved visiting um, a lot of antebellum sites, um, plantations, and um, a museum that really privileges or privileged the plantation owner's perspective, um, and then other places that are you know, doing work to gather and preserve the history of people who had been enslaved in, on those plantations. Um, and then, of course, there are many sites that are unmarked, um, I remember standing on a bridge that had once been the site of many slave auctions, according to a historian that I was with, and there was just a picnic table there and like nothing, um, and it was painful and um, just weighty to uh, think about how recent all of this really is. And on the last night of that trip, I attended a ring shout, which, as you know, is a tradition of praise, um, song, and rhythm. And uh, the spirituals that are sung are working on two levels. There's the surface level that says, you know, God is waiting to save you, believe, and you'll be delivered. And then there's the subtext that says, if you do this and not that, you have a better chance of escaping to freedom. And... Um, on that night, one of the performers came up to me before the show started, and she said, I love you, and she gave me a hug, and I just lost it. Everything that I was balancing just came out, um, and it was about gratitude for that gesture. And then she said it to the next person and the next person. She said it to every single person, and that didn't diminish it at all. And so I came home thinking about this gift and um, thinking, okay, that's the cure. That's the cure for everything. 
Um, and this is a poem that kind of helped me just to revisit that evening. Wade in the water for the Geechee Gullah ring shouters. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her, and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you, as she continued down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you. The angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel, knew to climb. Oh, woods. Oh, dogs. Oh, tree. Oh, gun. Oh, girl, run. Oh, miraculous many gone. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? Maybe I'll read the Baton Rouge poem since Raquel mentioned it. Um, I was invited, I was working for about six years on a book of prose and not writing a lot of poems during that time, so every time I was invited to contribute a poem for something, I tried to say yes, just so I wouldn't lose whatever was helping me to write poems, it wouldn't get frustrated with me. Um, so this is one of those invitations. Um, you remember the photo of a woman, a young woman during the one of the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations who's wearing this beautiful sundress and it's being blown in the wind and then facing her is a row of police officers wearing their um, riot gear and that image is called Unrest in Baton Rouge. The photographer who took it is named Jonathan Bachman and um, I was asked to just write a poem in response to this and I said okay, um, what do I see? I know what I feel um, about that event um, and the image, but I want to see it in a different way. So I, I was looking at the image and I said, well, literally there's this really palpable visual imbalance, this woman who's just almost naked, um, and then these, this group of men who are in this heavy protective, um, protective clothing. And then I started thinking, well, what's at stake here? What are they at risk of feeling or, or receiving, and I was thinking, what if it's something like love? What if this thing that we are obviously afraid of is the thing that is being defended against or fought back? Um, and then that, that helped me kind of find my way into language here. Unrest in Baton Rouge. Our bodies run with ink-dark blood. Blood pools in the pavement's seams. Is it strange to say love is a language, few practice, but all or near all speak? Even the men in black armor, the ones jangling handcuffs and keys, what else are they so buffered against if not love's blade sizing up the heart's familiar meat? We watch and grieve. We sleep, stir, eat, love, the heart sliced open, gutted, clean, love, naked almost in the everlasting street, skirt lifted by a different kind of breeze. Um, 
um, I was also invited to write a poem um, for an exhibition of portraits that were commemorating the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War. And, you know, as is my want, I, I said yes. And then I said, ooh, I don't, I, I know I don't like hearing tell of people dressing up and reenacting the Civil War. Um, I don't like the kinds of debates that I, I sometimes catch wind of where someone is trying to say it's not about slavery and someone is trying to say, but it is. Um, and so I said, well, how am I gonna find my way into this topic? And I said, well, if I can find some primary sources that will just tell me what black people were experiencing during the war, then I think I could get a poem out of that. And I found two really great books. Um, one is called Families and Freedom, and the other is called Voices of Emancipation. And what they contained were letters by soldiers and their family members to Abraham Lincoln, as well as to one another. And then another contained um, depositions that veterans and their widows and their descendants had given after the war in an attempt to claim a pension that as a US soldier, all of these people should have been entitled to. But if you think about it, um, if you're born into slavery, you don't get a birth certificate. If you get married um, during slavery, you don't get a marriage license. If you change your name after emancipation, there's not a paper trail that proves you are who you say you are. And so um, by the lack of these documents, many people were denied um, this pension that they should have had coming to them. And these claims go well into the 20th century. And I was reading through this material and I said, I don't, I don't need to add anything to this. I don't need to metabolize this and write a poem in my own voice. This is a story in and of itself and these voices feel so current and present and alive and they're full of um, dignity and faith in the institution of the presidency and in American democracy even though it, it you know had enslaved them um, and I just said I just have to listen I, I'm just going to bring a chorus of these voices together and, and maybe somebody will want to listen to them with me so um, it's a long poem I'm going to read you two brief sections the poem is called, I Will Tell You the Truth About This, I Will Tell You All About It. <clears throat> Excellent sir, my son went in the 54th Regiment. Sir, my husband, who is in Company K, 22nd Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops, and now in the Macon Hospital at Portsmouth with a wound in his arm, has not received any pay since last May. And then, only $13. Sir, we the members of Company D of the 55th Massachusetts Volunteers call the attention of your excellency to our case. For instant, look and see that we never was freed yet, run right out of slavery, in to soldiery, and we hadn't nothing at all. And our wives and mother, most all of them, is a perishing all about, and we all are perishing ourself. I am willing to be a soldier and serve my time faithful like a man, but I think it is hard to be put off in such doggish manner as that. Will you see that the colored men fighting now are fairly treated. You ought to do this, and do it at once. Not let the thing run along. Meet it quickly and manfully. We poor oppressed ones appeal to you and ask fair play. So please, if you can do any good for us, do it in the name of God. Excuse my boldness, but please, your reply will settle the matter and will be appreciated by a colored man who is willing to sacrifice his son in the cause of freedom and humanity. I have nothing more to say, hoping that you will lend a listening ear to an humble soldier. I will close. Yours, for Christ's sake, I shall have to send this without a stamp, for I hain't money enough to buy a stamp. I am 60 odd years of age. I am 62 years of age next month. I am about 65 years of age. 
I reckon I am about 67 years old. I am about 68 years of age. I am on the rise of 80 years of age. I am 89 years old. I am 94 years of age. I don't know my exact age. I am the claimant in this case. I have testified before you two different times before. I filed my claim, I think, first about 12 years ago. I am now an applicant for pension because I understand that all soldiers are entitled to a pension. I claim pension under the general law on account of disease of eyes as a result of smallpox contracted in service. The varicose veins came on both my legs soon after the war, and the sores were there when I first put in my claim. I claim pension for rheumatism and got my toe broke, and I was struck in the side with the breech of a gun, breaking my ribs. I was a man stout and healthy, over 27 years of age, when I enlisted. When I enlisted, I had a little mustache and some chin whiskers. I was a green boy, right off the farm, and did just what I was told to do. When I went to enlist, the recruiting officer said to me, your name is John Wilson. I said, no, my name is Robert Harrison, but he put me down as John Wilson. I was known while in service by that name. I cannot read nor write, and I do not know how my name was spelled when I enlisted, nor do I know how it is spelled now. I always signed my name while in the army by making my mark. I know my name by sound. My mother said after my discharge that the reason the officer put my name down as John Wilson was he could draw my bounty. I am the son of Solomon and Lucinda Sibley. I am the only living child of Dennis Campbell. My father was George Jordan and my mother was Millie Jordan. My mother told me that John Barnett was my father. My mother was Mary Eliza Jackson and my father, Reuben Jackson. My name on the roll was Frank Nunn. No, sir, it was not Frank Nern. My full name is Dick Lewis Barnett. I am the applicant for pension on account of having served under the name Lewis Smith, which was the name I wore before the days of slavery were over. My correct name is Hiram Kirkland. Some persons call me Harry and others call me Henry, but neither is my correct name. So um, thinking about that history um, and thinking just about, you know, the violence and um, I don't know what you would call it, distrust, fear that, um, you know, persists today. Um, I wrote this poem. I started to write a poem that was going to be in the voice of someone who was being apprehended by um, by a police officer, and I felt like I was on the path to not writing a very good poem because I had too much um, love or cherishing for my poem speaker. I already knew he was right, and I knew what I wanted him to say, and so I said, this isn't gonna work, but what would happen if I reversed the perspective? What would happen if I wrote the poem from the perspective of someone who's apprehending someone else and you know, maybe has um, you know, different motives for doing so, and maybe is also afraid um, in this, you know, encounter. And I wrote the poem, and then I said, well, what am I going to call it? And um, I ended up giving it a title that I think enlarged the scope of it. It's, it's called The United States Welcomes You. Why and by whose power were you sent? What do you see that you may wish to steal. Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then what is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession? Have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? 
then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night? Hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts. Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? What I like about writing poems is that they let you be your best self and struggle through, you know, what feel like big questions. And then if you let them, they allow you to be your real self um, and bumble through the real life of, you know, just being human. So I'll read you a couple of poems that bear witness to my bumbling. <laughs> this is called Beatific. I watch him bob across the intersection, squat legs bowed in black sweatpants. I watch him smile at nobody, at our traffic stopped to accommodate his slow going. His arms churn the air. His comic jog carries him nowhere. But it is as if he hears a voice in our idling engines calling him lithe, swift, prince of creation. Every least leaf shivers in the sun while we sit, bothered, late, captive to this thing commanding, wait for this man, wait for him. Charity. She is like a squat old machine, off kilter, but still chugging along the uphill stretch of sidewalk on Harrison Street, handbags slung crosswise, and I'm guessing heavy. And oh, the set of her face, her brows profound tracks, her mouth cinched, lips pressed flat. Watching her bend forward to tussle with gravity, watching the birth she allows each foot as if one is not on civil terms with the other, watching her shoulders braced as if lashed by step after step after step, and her eyes' determination not to shift or blink or rise, I think I am you, one day out of five, tired, empty, hating what I carry, but afraid to lay it down, stingy, angry, doing violence to others by the sheer freight of my gloom, halfway home, wanting to stop, to quit, but keeping going mostly out of spite. I think I'll close with a, um, a poem um, that I, I guess it arose out of another kind of invitation. I was asleep one night in Vermont, in Robert Frost's country, and I was having a dream that I was reading a poem that had been turned into a mural. And I was reading it aloud to someone and I was saying, this is a poem by so and such and such great poet. And then I said, no, it's not. That's not a poem by him. I'm gonna wake up and write this poem. So I woke up and wrote this poem. Um, uh, and this is another poem that got a title um, renovation. <laughs> And so the title uh, urges it to become larger than it originally set out to be. Political poem. If those mowers were each to stop at the whim, say, of a greedy thought, and then the one off to the left were to let his arm float up, stirring the air with that wide, slow, underwater gesture, meaning, hello, and you there, aimed at the one more than a mile away to the right. And if he, in his work, were to pause, catching that call by sheer wish, and to send back his own slow, one-armed dance, meaning yes and here, as if threaded to a single long nerve, before remembering his tool and shearing another message into the earth, 
letting who can say how long graze past until another thought or just the need to know might make him stop and look up again at the other, raising his arm as if to say something like, still, and oh, and then to catch the flicker of joy rise up along those other legs and flare into another bright yes that sways a moment in the darkening air. Their work would carry them into the better part of evening, each mowing ahead and doubling back, then looking up to catch sight of his echo, sought and held in that instant of common understanding, the God and speed of it coming out only after both have turned back to face the sea of yet and slow. If they could, and if what glimmered like a fish were to dart back and forth across that wide, wordless distance, the day, though gone, would never know the ache of being done. If they thought to, or would, or even half wanted, their work, the humming human engines pushed across the grass, and the grass, blade after blade assenting, would take forever. But I love how long it would last. Thank you so much. Thank you. How do you begin classes at Princeton, like at the beginning of the semester? Um, well, uh, well, one thing I like to do is to start out, I have this list of um, different definitions of a poem, mostly by poets, but some are by like children. Um, and I inherited many of the items on this list from one of my first teachers who was the poet Lucy Brock Broido, who um, we sadly lost recently. Um, and then I've, I've gone adding to this list. So I like to spend some time just reading these things aloud. Like, um, you know, William Carlos Williams says a poem is a small or large machine made of words. Or Robert Frost has like a dozen of these really pithy definitions. But a poem is like a piece of ice on a hot stove. It um, goes on its own undoing or something like that. It rides on its own undoing. And then there's a children's definition of, of a poem that my teacher gave me. Um, a poem is an egg with horses in it. And um, we just love thinking about what these different things say about what poems do and what they make us feel like. And then we'll just dive in to a handful of poems. Nobody's got a poem to workshop on the first day. So we'll just read um, a number of poems closely talking about what we notice. Um, I always use a lot of published work in my workshops because it's how you learn how to write. And if you can learn how to talk about poems, then you develop a vocabulary for what poems do and a sense of what you want to do. So we spend that first class just doing that, which is really fun. And then they get down to brass tacks and have to write poems. <laughs> um. The uh, the poem about the the pensions was that like from like was that based from like a court ledger like actual like like what people were um, saying you know what I mean? one of the books Voices of Emancipation um, it contain its files I'll read you the full title of the book and I'll let you know who wrote it too um, um, Voices of Emancipation Understanding Slavery the Civil War and Reconstruction through the U.S. Pension Bureau files, and it's um, edited by Elizabeth Rogosin and Donald Schaefer. And it's just pages and pages of testimonies that people gave um, in those, those, you know, like, sessions. Um, and then there are other, there's another book called Families and Freedom that is, you know, c collects a lot of the correspondence. Um, so, yeah, just reading through those things, it's a real education. Here. Can you just say something about what being poet laureate means to you, what that's like, of, uh -huh. you know, what's that well, all about for you? Okay, well the nice thing about it is it, it's such a loose uh, set of requirements that everybody gets to interpret it differently. Um, what everyone is asked to do is raise the public awareness of poetry 
um, awareness and appreciation of poetry. Um, but everybody gets to decide how to do that. Um, my project involves going to rural communities in different parts of the country and um, reading poems, combination of my own poems and then poems by other living American poets and talking about what people think, what you hear. I like to believe that a poem eliminates the need for small talk. You read a poem and you don't have to say, oh, well, it's nice outside, right? You, you get to say, oh, gosh, this reminds me of losing a parent. Or this poem, you know, speaks to my fears as a parent. And um, it's exciting to have that conversation, which is different everywhere you go, every group of people, to be able to have it in parts of the country that I've never visited and where there aren't a lot of literary programs that tend to come. Um, the thing I didn't expect um, is that I should have known, um, but you know, you have this title for a little while and people say, well, what do you think? What do you think about poetry? What do you think about the role or the relevance of the art form? And I, I had to sort of say, well, I'm not, to myself, I'm not Robert Frost, I'm not Robert Pinsky, but I do think certain things about poetry. I have some beliefs about this thing and I get to talk about them. In order to talk about them, I have to kind of sort them out a little bit. So that's been a really nice side effect. You get to say, I'm an advocate for this thing that is good in a world where there are so many things that um, are not good. So I have two uh, young children, toddlers. Um, how would you introduce or you know, uh, poetry in your children's life as, as they were growing up? And is, are there children's poems? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot. Poetry? I mean, there's there's a lot of children's poetry. I just got sent. I, I visited uh, North Carolina. I met this v woman who was 95, who is like 45 in terms of energy, or even 35, because she has more than me. And she said, "Oh, A. A. Milne, you know, the author of um, Winnie the Pooh. My kids loved his poems, or her. I don't even know if it's male or female author. Um, and she sent me a couple of books. So my daughter, it was just disappeared into one the other day." Um, and I, there's a collection that I was given by a st former student when I had my first child called Poetry Speaks to Children. And it's just a collection of poems, some contemporary, there are poems by like Rita Dove or Maxine Cuman, and then poems by Ogden Nash, and uh, poems that you think of as children's poetry. And there's a CD of the poet or someone else reading the poems, and that's really fun. Um, but then, you know, a lot of children's picture books are written in verse. Um, and I love one called Owl Moon. It's actually, I would say it's free verse. Jane Yolen is the author, um, and it's so beautifully attentive to detail and sound. Um, but children are so naturally poetic. They don't have a fear of metaphor. They live in metaphor. They project it, they manifest it. And so I really believe that introducing a kid to poetry is really just not discouraging that tendency and not saying, oh, come on now, let's be realistic, but, you know, like honoring that so they don't have to relearn it 15 years later. Now, or maybe uh, just as you close, you wouldn't mind reading Declaration. Um, I just love that poem since I saw it in the okay. New York. I've been, <laughs> and I just, I'm very interested to see how what you do with the white spaces and and how that's uh, okay in you. I'll read it, but if there are other questions, okay. it doesn't have to be the final word, <laughs> unless someone says that it does. Um, so this is a found poem, um, which means that I, I found an existing document and I listened for different statements within it, and I made a poem of those. It's kind of an erasure of the Declaration of Independence. And I wrote it because I initially was trying to write a Thomas Jefferson poem for something that I'd been invited to do, done, thought I did a bad job, and wanted to do over. Um, and then I, I saw this, and I said, forget about Thomas Jefferson. I think I found something here that speaks unsettlingly to um, to now. Declaration. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He has plundered our, ravaged our, destroyed the lives of our, taking away our abolishing our most valuable, 
and altering fundamentally the forms of our. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here, taken captive on the high seas to bear and pleasures of moving between writing poetry and writing prose? Um, um, I feel like they use different parts of my brain. <laughs> they, there's overlap. Um, I think I'm thinking in the conscious part of my brain when I'm writing a poem, but that quickly gives way to something else. I'm listening to the sound of words and that carries me somewhere. I'm looking, uh, watching for images and metaphors that can carry me somewhere else. and. I am um, just kind of hoping that there's something outside of me that can help me too. And I feel like I'm probably doing that when I write prose, but I'm also thinking logically, more deliberately, more actively relying on logic. And then there are moments when I can sort of open up and do some of those other things, but I have to remember I'm going somewhere here too. Um, and that was something that was hard to learn at first. I, I wanted to write a memoir because I wanted to do something different, come to different like realizations about the questions that I tend to have. But um, then it meant, okay, you can't, I can't just put an image in there and then scat, you know, I've got to like stay put and then talk about that image and talk about what it speaks to and where it comes from and what it doesn't regard. And it was scary to do that at first and then it became really exciting because it allowed different kinds of layers to accrue uh, in the text. Um, whose voices do you wish were louder in poetry or, or perhaps more listened to? And who do you wish saw themselves as poets more? Mm, that's a really beautiful question. Well, I'm going to start by saying I feel really good about the world of poetry right now because as opposed to what it was like 25 years ago when I was a student, there's a great deal more diversity of every kind including age. Um, it used to be like almost impossible, it seemed, for someone to publish a first book of poems. There were like three or four prizes, and no press was interested in publishing a first book other, other outside of the prize stream, um, probably for sales purposes. Um, so now that's different, and we have a lot of organizations like Kundiman or you know, Kave Kanam that are bringing poets together along different kinds of lines, um, celebrating these different traditions. There's a really healthy um, tradition now of um, immigrant poetry, um, poetry that comes out of you know, the experience of being first or second generation. Um, and um, so that excites me. Um, I I would love to see people who um, aren't confident <laughs> write poems, who feel like um, they might not have an audience and who aren't even concerned necessarily with that audience, but who um, want to hear something in language that is meaningful and necessary. Um, I, I love that poetry and creative writing programs have become so popular, but it's almost become like such a such a beautiful, fashionable thing to do that um, sometimes it's easy to forget that we're all ugly misfits and you know, like there's no fame at the end of this road. It's like a dark hallway. Um, so I, I'd like to kind of be invited back into that hallway by maybe people who are in it for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a start. I don't, I don't know. I, it's a good question to think about. I'm really interested in what you're talking about poetry and working toward your best self and then the real self. Um, anything that you can talk about between the life in poetry and the life outside of it for you, um, what can poetry do? in the world and what shouldn't we expect it to do? Um, kind of how you move between the, the real poetry center in your life and 
integrating it with the other things in the world? Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, poetry can sort of help us to reaffirm what it means to be human and vulnerable and temporary. Um, despite the features of our world that want to tell us that we're all um, important because we have buying power and we um, are so important because we're busy and we um, are so lucky that we can curate our circle of friends and influences to exclude people that don't think or look or sound like us. Um, I think that's a trap. You know, I think it's, um, it's really in the service of corporations because they're vehicles for social media. Um, they're selling us things at the, at the heart of all those algorithm, algorithms. It's about what we'll buy. Um, and so we're pandered to so that we keep buying. Um, poetry isn't really selling you anything. I remember reading a um, little, James Dickey did this book of self-interviews and he worked for an advertising company but he would spend time in his office writing poems and then this was the 60s, so he would give a poem to his secretary and say, type this up. And then she said, well, what is this? What are we selling? And he said, we're selling God. And um, I feel like poems aren't selling you anything if, you know, but like just like something that's intangible, mysterious and, and supremely valuable. Um, so they invite us to turn off our phones and get out of the browser and look up and look at people and worry about people and talk to people and then apply some of the things we learn to ourselves. A uh, can of worms. I don't know what power or authority or even sway you have, especially in Washington, also with teachers or teaching. My, my point is that I don't know what, how to make things better in America, but a part of it to me would be creativity, and poetry is a small part of that creativity. I don't know what we can do to put to encourage that. Uh, now they're like teaching the test, or even like this teaching test questions. So they're cutting back on all the things. And again, they say, "Well, I'm, you're not making millions and billions of dollars, so what use is it?" And I would say, "Well, there's a gentleman that's exactly my age. He's actually four days older, and I was reading his work about 1975-76. He had this idea, which I." I I understood, but I couldn't see the point of. He said, imagine a computer that would be practical, affordable, and you could do all sorts of things with it if you just program it properly. And I said, well, I, I don't see, even, even you can kind of cost the computer down to $2,200, I don't see the point in that. And Bill Gates figured it out. So to me, there might be some way to talk to people and authorities say, well, we don't know what the next brilliant thing will be. It might be poetry, it might be art, it might be science, it might be something we haven't even thought of yet. So just, I don't know, what, being a poet laureate, do you have any sway at all or any say so? <laughs> Thank you. I don't have sway, but I have an idea that it's, it's an analog device. <laughs> and I think it is, um, it comes in a big box that says, okay, the first step in the instructions is you have to allow yourself to be bored for 15 minutes and then see what your imagination invents and then do practice this each day. Um, I know like I have kids who are in school and they're gonna be subject to all the testing, but I also, um, I'm that mom that says, you're not gonna use an iPad when you come home. You're gonna you know, sit and either be bored or figure out a way not to be bored. And maybe in 30 years you'll like me for having done that. Um, but we just have to do that. So when you're doing the work of unearthing all these voices and traveling to places that um, can be pretty traumatic, what do you do afterwards when it feels a bit heavy to sort of reset and take a step back? Um, is there anything that you do or any practices that you do to sort of help um, with, that, with that weight? Um, well, I like talking to people. I talk to my husband. He's right there. Um, conversation is like this art form that is so imperiled, um, but it's so healthy and it allows you to sort through feelings, share them, um, let go of them. And I also, uh, I write, that's what poetry does. It's a way that I can process and interrogate 
I don't know where a poem is going. I just know that if I can pursue it, I might be able to make better sense of the stuff that is um, kind of swirling around in there. Hi, um, I'm actually a songwriter, and I'm just really interested in hearing maybe uh, musicians or songs that really speak to you because of the lyrics, um, if maybe like you get lost in them or you found like a lot of inspiration out of them because of what they can give you in that way. Um, yeah, I grew up in the, I was born in the 70s, so that's the music that I think is the best <laughs> pop music. So um, my last book is really kind of an homage to David Bowie in a lot of ways. Um, I always accidentally call his songs poems because they feel like that sometimes, or I feel that way too about Bob Dylan. Um, who else? Who do we listen to? Paul Simon, um, Nina Simone. Um, yeah, I mean, songs, we, we let songs talk to us about what we feel, what we wish, what we've lost. And then sometimes you get handed a poem and you're like, I don't know what to do with this. But it's kind of trying to do the same thing. It's just making its own music, um, you know, rhythmically. It's, it's not um, accompanied by, by these other instruments. Uh -huh. I, I've never done spoken word poetry. Um, I'm one of those writers who writes because probably fundamentally I'm a little shy. Um, and I need, I don't memorize my poems. I, um, so I've never done it before. I have a lot of students who do both. I, I think it's exciting. I, I, I value the art form. I've just never put myself out there. Um, I've never judged it either. I've had, um, I think the closest I've come to judging spoken word is to be a judge for Poetry Out Loud once, which is like a youth um, activity where you recite, you memorize and recite poems with a certain dramatic element and you're judged on this really strict rubric. I, I think it's probably more exhaustive than other, other ones, but like, Mem memorization, comprehension, dramatic presentation, and maybe like five or six other things. Um, and I, I don't know, I didn't really feel qualified to tell some 13-year-old that you didn't bring enough oomph to the poem. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. All right, thank you very much.